have you join um, by, by voice. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll go ahead and get started and I will um, introduce our panelists. Uh, the way, again, I'll just start. My name is Christina Lively. I'm the program manager for the Master of Medical Sciences in Global Health Delivery, and we are celebrating our 10th anniversary, the 10th anniversary of our launch. The launch was in 2012. And so 2022 is our is the 10th anniversary and we're continuing to celebrate this year. To celebrate, we are having a series of alumni panels to bring back the alumni who have graduated in the past um, 10 years of the program to see what kind of work they've been doing after they've graduated. Uh, the Master of Medical Sciences and Global Health Delivery is a two-year master's program. Students spend a year taking classes and also developing a, a thesis project, and then they go into the field and complete that thesis project and come back to Harvard and um, up, uh, analyze and, and write up the thesis project. So uh, today we have uh, two alumni and I will introduce them quickly. And then what we'll do just to give you an overview of how our format will work, we'll have each alumni give a presentation on their work. And then we will have um, time for a Q&A and a discussion. And to participate in the Q&A, we're going to have you folks use, if you look to the bottom of the screen, there's a Q&A um, chat box, and you can type your question in there. You can type it at any time. Um, panelists may, they may respond by text, or we may answer the questions live, but we will wait and take questions. We'll answer questions later um, after the presentations are done. Feel free to put them in the chat anytime. Okay, so today we have, again, two, um, two alumni joining us. We're so grateful. We have Jude Bouchon, and Jude is a senior project lead in with Partners in Health. He graduated in from our program in 2017. Uh, he's worked with Partners in Health for a long time and has worked on tuberculosis care in different places, in, including Haiti and, um, let's see, it's Liberia. Yes, Liberia. And now he's working um, with uh, migrant farmer communities in Florida. So um, Jude will speak first, but first I'll also introduce Sarisha. Sarisha, sorry, Sarisha Pavaneni is um, research and evalu and he evaluation head in tuberculosis. She's worked in um, on tuberculosis in India since 2014. She graduated from our program in 2020, and so Sarisha will speak a little later. But we'll start with Jude. Go ahead, Jude. Good morning. Um afternoon evening to everyone thank you for having us it's a it's a real, uh, pleasure and privilege to be back and thank you joya christina for the invitation um let me go ahead and share my screen can you see my screen okay um I mean, first of all, I want to say thank you to so many of you who over the years has uh, supported me and continue to support me. Uh, you really helped me grow over the years, so I'm really grateful uh, to that. And also, as we commemorated um, uh, one of our greatest mentors uh, passing, one year passing last week, I did want to uh, um, keep him uh, in our mind during uh, this presentation. Uh, I by, by having the opportunity to do my social service uh, with, with Zamila Sante Partners in Health in Haiti and then be part of this program, that really helped me to do what I think, um, what I call to take outside the clinician box. Because as a young uh, med graduate, I think my mindset was mostly sitting at the hospital and waiting for patients to come to me. But being part of this great family helped me to, to take differently, to think how I I can take into consideration structural barriers patient face and how myself I can help alleviate those barriers and help them get the, the care they need. And to me, it's no coincidence that I am working with tuberculosis uh, because to me, it's such a complex disease, but can so accurately speak to our patient social condition uh, 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 because it's, it's, it's no wonder why uh, the, the pool most of the time bear the majority or bear the biggest burden of TB disease. And again, it's no wonder why Haiti has uh, the biggest burden of, of TB disease in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, estimated 168, and this is actually a low estimate, 168 per 100,000 population. And with regard to DRTB, there is, uh, and this is not a situation specific to Haiti, it's a, it's a, it's a global trend. 
uh, there is a chronic um, or pervasive or even heartbreaking lack of access to care for, for patients with DRTB. And as we can see in 2015, um, when I was doing this research for my master thesis, actually only, I mean, less than 12% of the DRTB burden of the country got access to care. And in 2020, things got even worse for all the reason you know, and actually that, that number were, were, were even smaller, less than 7%. And to give you more context of the uh, uh, treatment in Haiti, DRTB treatment in Haiti, the treatment is very centralized, one by two NGOs. Uh, so a patient has to, to come from all around the country to go to those places to, to get care they need. And, and, and imagine Haiti as a poor country with not so much wood infrastructure. So you, you can imagine trouble patient had to get into in order to, to, to go get the care they need. And also the treatment of, is hospital-based. Uh, which means patients have to get hospitalized for about six to eight months for the first part, in the inpatient part, and then get sent back home for the remaining part, for the 12, with the expectation. Right? And I say, we're well, expectation, they will come uh, monthly for follow-up visit for another 12 to 16 months. But this is not all, this is not the case all the time, because as we see in our practice, sometimes patients do uh, worsen clinically and even die. And, and we, we have the story of one of our patients, we call him Alfred. And, and I think Alfred can, can speak or can relate to hundred, if not thousand of patients globally. I, I, I typically get access to care very late, get hospitalized eventually, even though he, they get better. But once they return home in the same condition they were living, they they uh, they face a um, a decline in their uh, clinical um, a response or their clinical evolution, and some of them uh, die. This is uh, the story of uh, of Alfred. And thinking about the this lack of care, and also keeping Alfred in our mind, um, and witnessing that almost all the time in our practice, we, we came to ask ourselves, what are these factors first that prevent patients to get access to care, but also what are those factors? Why when, when they return home, particularly in the hospital-based setting, they face, some of them, many of them face this decline in their clinical uh, response. How could, how could we avoid what Paul would call those to be deaf, those avoidable deaths? And to, to, to have more perspective, more patient perspective, we did that study in 2016, I believe, uh, in which we, we look at uh, factors that for sure explain delay before or prior treatment initiation. And also to take time to, to try to look at this critical transition period after, after discharge, the month when they went back home, the, those first few months, to try to look at that period and capture those clinical changes that 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 that's happening and and and, and also uh, from patient perspective try to see if the same factors at treatment initiation persist when they return home and are common they are in 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 what we call unsuccessful transition when they uh, go back home it's not rocket science, but we wanted to, we wanted to hear from our patient and advise policymakers. A couple of photos from our treatment centers. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying to stay on time. Um, um, in upper, for those who are familiar with Haiti, upper left is Hesh and lower white in Kanj uh, with the pavilion Thomas G. White. And uh, a picture of one of my patient home in, in, the, in deep south. And lower white is me interviewing that patient at discharge. That was when I was younger in 2016. Um, we use a three-part mixed method study with a qualitative interview with interviews at discharge again to try to capture in, um, information about what what contribute to delay, and then we try to document um, their patient clinical response. Uh, monthly, 
to capture, again, to capture how they are doing clinically, to document that and, 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 and capture it. And then at the end, we did a follow-up qualitative interview, again, to describe what are those barriers? Are they the same from, um, from initiation that continues? It, it would make more sense to, to if, if, we have, uh, if, if we have time to do this quantitative part for a long period, but because of time constraint, we were able to do it in, um, in over only uh, four months. Uh, to, to quantify those clinical changes, we use the, this uh, scoring system, mostly clinical and, and lab indicators. And if, if it's normal, zero as as a, a value as value and then if abnormal one 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 or two for the sake of time we we we, we can talk more more about the scoring system in, in the QA. Our study population relatively young uh the majority 30 years or or, or, or younger slightly more female uh, even though they might be considered as adult but were still living with their parents and even though they have the opportunity to reach high secondary or higher level of education, but unfortunately, they do not have a good stable job as more of them work as street vendor or peasant farmer to support themselves and their family. So essentially poor people. In terms of quantitative data, we were able to capture changes after patient went back home. And I believe about, about five patients did present a decline in their clinical response. As you can see, their mean score were higher. The higher the score, the, 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 more, the more likely the, 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 they have a compromised clinical response. Essentially, that would mean low BMI, they are not getting weight, um, they are feeling depressed, uh, not much changes in their x-ray, things like that. But with, with again, with the scoring system, we try to capture that. And with the follow-up qualitative interview, this is just a summary of the team that emerged. I mean, first of all, being the primary wage earner is a big factor that contribute to delay, but, but also worsening after they went back home after the, the, the first part of the treatment. Why? Just think about a mother of four who is a street vendor. So every day that that, that person has to go out and fi find and sell few things she she could do to sell she could find to sell to support to to bring food and and other needs to her kids imagine that 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 person will not have the luxury to to have uh, sick days because she has to go out and sell what 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 she could that's how she bring food to her table every day and even if that person take days to try to get help, likely it will be uh, uh, to a clinic far away. And likely that clinic in the countryside will uh, misdiagnose her. This will take time. So it, it will be most of the time when that person get very sick, they will eventually get, get to Kanj or Hinge. And that same person get hospitalized for sure will get improved. But when we send that person back home, returning in the same situation, I'm sure that person will not have peace of mind to continue her treatment for 12 to 16 months peacefully. Very likely that person will face the pressure again to go out and find food or money to bring to her kids, which will lead to treatment interruption. That, that the same thing goes for uh, wage losses for, for those who have uh, formal jobs. And the RTB itself, the care-seeking process can equate financial ruin for many families because they have to sell what they have. Uh, social dis uh, disruption for those at school and, and geographical challenges as well. To, to put that into perspective, in red, uh, estimate patient location in our study and in blue, treatment center. About in, in among 17 patients, 10 live over 150 miles to treatment centers. And again, talking about Haiti, the poor country with not so much wooden structure, that means our patient usually take one or two days to get to treatment center. And think about someone who had to do that on a monthly basis for about 20 to 24 months, let alone 
and transportation costs. In order to address some of those challenges, the, the Ministry of Health were able to make some gene expert machine, and I said some, uh, available in the countryside. It was not, soups, I mean, a big thing, super, but it did help because at least the the, the referring treatment centers will, will have somewhere closer to send their sputum for suspected uh, cases. But the other challenge was when that person is confirmed or suspected, how do we get that person to conch? I mean, challenge, because most of the time those referring TB treatment centers, their, their ambulance, they, they do not have fuels or the ambulance is broken. So we had that, that's where we stepped in providing uh, reimbursement for transportation of fuels to those um, referring um, uh, TB centers. While we continue with providing social support for our patient after uh, they get discharged and also to, to help break the cycle of poverty, sometimes we step in providing some economic activities um, up to help with uh, community reinsertion. I have a couple of examples I can I can I talk more about during q &A. And talking about uh, how the, the, the impact of us stepping, providing uh, transportation reimbursement, we started that program. This is our, our patient treatment initiation um, over the years from 2008 to 2020. We, we started with providing reimbursement, fuel reimbursement, or uh, fees reimbursement to, we started with that in, in 2020. And as we can see, there is a, a significant and continued increase uh, in the number of patients we were able to, to, to put to, to, to bring to treatment initiation. It's essentially, again, providing fees for parents who bring that patient to us, we reimburse them the money they spent bringing that patient to us, or we are bursting hospital um, for fuels. Lesson learned, I think I have two or three more slides. Uh, again, it's critical that we understand our patient living condition, our patient situation to be able to help them, to help break the cycle of poverty. And I think it's even, I mean, providing blanket social support is good, but I think it's even, it's possible to go even deeper because unfortunately all of our patients are not equal. We, we need to find the progress among the pool and try to provide this additional support to them. And this study show that it is possible to identify patients who might be at greater risk of poor outcome when they um, return home so we can tailor our support to their needs. And a couple of photos of one of our patients after treatment that was in remote Liberia, he lost everything. He didn't have a place to stay, so we help him. It does not, does, does not, that does not cost a lot of money. I can assure you, we help him build a small but but dignified um, um, structure, so he can have a place to stay when uh, after treatment a discharge. And this case was particularly heartbreaking to us, uh, as you can see. Before there was not even a roof, and this is only one room. There was not even a roof. That patient has drug resistant tuberculosis and two kids. The, the other part, she was selling um, charcoal. So she had charcoal bags. She could not leave the, the charcoal bag, bags outside. So she had, she had to put them inside the room. So imagine a small room with charcoal bag inside. So that person had only a small space left for her to sleep with her two kids on the floor. I think that was heartbreaking. I think there was no way uh, that person will go to that treatment without her help. So we were able to, 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 to help her. Again, that does not cost a lot of money to renovate her, her house and build a small structure outside the house where she can put the, the charcoal bag. Um, Why, with the executive director, we were, we were um, exploring what else we can help the patient do beside um, uh, selling charcoals. And the last slide, just to say, this is not just DRTB. And I can talk more about our experience during COVID-19. Uh, I had the opportunity to step on shoulder of great mentors and colleagues such as Fernia and Dan in Imakali. This shows that, again, it's not just DRTB. The same challenges, the same structural challenges exist for other infectious diseases 
and we have to 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 bring the same approach to them. And I said at factor, this is because this is my experience, but I'm pretty sure other people would just say across diseases. And I want to hand with this quote from Dubois again, reminding us that TB has a social disease. We'll we'll need um, social uh, approach in our response. Thank you. And apologies to go over the 15 minutes more. That's okay. okay. Thank, thank you so much for thank you so much for your talk. Oh, Joya is oh my goodness, <laughs> Joya is on with us. Joya, we don't thank hear you. So much you. For can you up your volume? It's all the way maxed. Okay, that's me? great. We can hear you now. Yes. Oh, I didn't hear anything. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't do anything. Um, so Jude, thank you so much. And again, I apologize. I'm here today in Rwanda. I've been at the University of Global Health Equity this week. Uh, working with the very master students who are uh, your colleagues. And so, you know, I hope we can have some joint conferences with them. Um, I think one of the key points that I was making this week and your presentation, and I'm really looking forward to hearing Shrisha and having a discussion, um, your presentation really makes a case I have been pointing out so often, which is we have to separate cognitive um, ideas of treatment failure from material causes of treatment failure. We have to separate cognitive ideas of prevention from material ideas of prevention. And I think this is the most important task for us in looking at equity and you're right to put infectious in quotes because it's everything. And so, I think as we think about and really develop this concept of global health as, as the pursuit of equity, not just as some sort of exotic thing, but taking it from Immokalee to um, Haiti and Liberia and India, we have to see that it's transfer fees, it's food, it's housing security. Um, it's not that people don't want to get well or they don't understand it. And so I, I think it's it's up to all of us to really make that shift in consciousness that moves away from the, the idea that we just have to educate poor people to do better. Um, rather, it's we uh, who are in charge of health systems that need to do better. So I thought that bringing the Amakali in is such an important um, is such an important thing. And, you know, I'm I'm looking forward to. Um, to uh, Shrisha's uh, uh, presentation. There is a question in the chat uh, for you, Jude, on, um, on Haiti, but let's, let's, let's hear from Shrisha first, and then we can take all the questions, because I think a lot of the questions will apply to both presentations. Sure, thanks, Raya. Let me share my screen. Okay, I hope it's visible and I hope I'm audible. Yes. Someone please let me know if I'm not. Yes, um, we can hear you and, and see the slides, thanks. Great, great. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about differential care models. Um, and I think this is something that Jude also touched upon in one of his slides, which is looking at tailored services for patients, right? Um, and that's um, and that manifests in different ways, especially in the Indian TB context. So I could start with that. Um, just to give everyone a background, um, so India has a population of you know about 1.4 billion, huge number. Uh, has a highest burden of TB in the world with over two million incident TB cases. It accounts for 36 percent of global TB deaths. So you can see in the global map just the relative burden of TB compared to other high um, high notifying high burden countries as well. Um, and one of the biggest challenges in India. And one of the biggest challenges always articulated by the National TB program is a limited number of healthcare workers to coordinate such large patient volumes. Right? So you'll see very poor um, staff to patient ratios in terms of being able to deliver that comprehensive care. Um, and the reason I, I just want us to keep this in mind, this idea of large patient volumes and not enough staff, as we think about differential care, because that's something that will become a theme in terms of how we conceptualize differential care and how we implement it. Um, the other factor contributing to differential care or requiring differential care is um, obviously inequities. India is an incredibly diverse country. 
um, over 22 official languages. If you move to a different state, you're in a different language, in a different political context, different cultural environment. And within that, there are certain intrinsic characteristics that really drive um, healthcare inequities very deeply. Uh, these include class, caste, religion, gender, in inequitable physical access to care, the strength of local public health systems, political and governance structures um, at a local level, environmental factors. You can see a map here of just India's pollution level as an example. You can range from unhealthy to hazardous. Um, and you know, that's obviously something that not just not only specific to TB, but exacerbates general lung health for communities. Access to regular nutritious food. India is home to one of the largest malnourished populations um, with low BMI and also housing structures. And one um, image that you can see here is an informal housing structure in the district of Surat, uh, one of the districts where I worked in for Muslim communities, literally built next to a sewer line. So, and it's amazing that there's a boundary around this community where if you walk on that boundary, you literally see a TB patient in every other household. And you'll meet someone in that household who has a family member who also has a history of TB. And we have healthcare workers here who often tell us they don't, you know, they don't bother looking for TB cases. They just visit every other house with the assumption that there'll be a TB case there. Um, so that's the kind of uh, inequities that we see, just the sort of physical environmental manifestation that we see um, in the Indian context. Um, and then given these inequities, obviously, I think we understand that TB as an illness would manifest itself very differently, right, within a biological, social, environmental, cultural, clinical context. Um, but the India's TB program has always just deployed very standardized protocols for TB care. It's mostly been clinical based, you know, uh, only uh, the care delivery is largely only structured around um, treatment regimen. But we understand now in the larger advocacy that's moving uh, forward in India is that uh, understanding that certain populations are at much higher risk and that require enhanced care and more personalized care. Right? And this is what we're calling differentiated care. It's not a new term. It's something that's been deployed in HIV um, uh, care models as well. It's basically that patients, based on their certain subpopulation characteristics, their environment, their material needs, their clinical characteristics, their contacts, they just require a different level and different type of support. Um, so how, what does differential care look like in the Indian TB context? So uh, I'll talk a little bit more about how is India looking at it from a policy environment as well. And when we talk about differential care in India, the question that arises is, okay, who is considered high risk? We need to divide this population into high risk groups and low risk groups. And we need to tailor a lot of these services that enhance care delivery to these high risk groups. And again, remember the policy environment is also taking into consideration that it's quote unquote resource limited, meaning uh, there's not a willingness to really increase that staff to patient ratio so uh, that they're trying to reallocate these resources to really um, high risk patients and focus care there. And that obviously has different implications that we'll talk about later, but that's the kind of the policy environment that we're talking about when we talk about implementing differentiated care. So I'll briefly just talk about um, what I focus my thesis around. Um, so part of identifying um, who is high risk and who is not, um, who is relatively low risk perhaps is looking at adherence data. So there was a lot of literature in India documenting the relationship between adherence and TB recurrence. Um, so one of, the, uh, uh, one of the initiatives and pilots that we deployed were uh, trying to collect adherence data from patients to understand which patients were non-adherent so we get some kind of a signal from communities, okay, that these patients or these family members are not able to support the patient in their treatment. Then we can reach those households. Um, and this would be the high risk group that we were talking about and, um, and understand what the underlying risks for non-adherence and, um, and, and have that differential care protocols deployed. So there's a lot of rich literature around documenting, you know, why adherence is an important risk factor. And within that context, a lot of the pilots that we ended up working on and deploying were around digital enhanced technologies. So one intervention was something um, called 99 dots, for example, that you see here, where a patient basically, when they take their dose, there's a toll-free number that they call, and then that registers in our calendar as a dose taken. So all the greens that you see, for example, in this visual, um, indicates that um, these patients have taken their medication for that calendar day. And any reds or pinks that you see are basically patients that are potentially have missed their doses, right? So this is a way to kind of understand what is happening. And again, keep in mind, 
uh, this is coming from a high volume uh, uh, context, right? So we have millions of patients you're trying to monitor and you just don't know who is doing well and who is not. So this is one mechanism to understand who requires differentiated care and who doesn't, or who requires maybe just the standard of care. So um, there were some challenges to be using adherence um, as this sort of risk stratification model. Um, so you, you still require patients to call. So not everybody will call every day for six months on a daily basis, right? So what we found is when there was a third-party evaluation that was done, where if a patient is calling, which means those green signals, um, we can, we're fairly confident that they're taking their medication, but these red signals, we didn't have that much confidence that they were not taking their medication, right? Because red is supposed to mean that they're not taking their medication. But sometimes people would, you know, just take their medication, not call, so it wasn't a perfect method to um, uh, stratify this sort of high-risk non-adherent patients, but it still gave us a lot of data on trying to get to that group. Um, and then once we got to that group, we tried to understand what are the underlying challenges here in terms of engaging with treatment. And that included um, having uh, differentiated treatment protocols for substance use disorders, as well as mental health challenges, to name a few. So I think Christina also wanted us to talk a little bit about what we were doing after um, graduation. So that was my thesis working around adherence um, and looking at how do you identify risk among all these groups and how do you develop these protocols? But the policy environment in the last three years um, after I finished my master's has actually changed um, quite significantly, primarily with the deployment of artificial intelligence models um, and machine learning models. And India is one of the few countries that's really ready to deploy these models at a huge scale um, in a healthcare setting, specifically in a TB setting. So one model has been developed by a third party um, artificial intelligence agency. Um, and basically the way this model works is that you uh, you can upload a data about patients that's uh, and data that's typically collect collected as part of medical records, right? Which is your age, uh, the patient's, you know, gender, uh, their location, their pulmonary, extra pulmonary case, new retreatment, basic clinical details and demographic details. And the AI model, which has been trained on, you know, millions and millions of um, India's data sets uh, from millions and millions of TB patients, will basically assign a risk for this patient, a high risk or a low risk. So these AI models will basically spit out this kind of a risk um, categorization of a patient. So this is just a, some dummy information here, but you'll see every patient will have a categorization of low or high. So you can kind of understand what the challenges are, right? Because not of these, a lot of these models are trained on very basic data when they're trying to identify who needs differentiated care. And the data that they're trained on is only um, looking at basic demographic information that's available and just basic clinical details of TB, the TB disease itself that's available. So you're not looking at a lot of these other, um, you know, drivers of inequity that we were discussing before. Um, it's, uh, it's doing risk stratification based on very limited information. And now these models are going to be, you know, deployed on a large scale and basically telling healthcare workers to manage um, high-risk patients as, you know, indicated by the algorithm. Um, so currently, uh, what we're doing now is working on evaluating these models, um, and you can see, um, you know, we have challenges in terms of saying, okay, we can say these models are not very accurate um, in terms of their risk assessments. You can also start seeing that there's lower accuracy among women in some of these baseline models. Um, so you see there's a lot of bias that's um, um, also uh, occurring in these deployments. And India is not the first sort of us. Um, you know, context where um, AI or machine learning kind of models have been deployed. Um, this is something that recently I came across. There's an algorithm that um, has been deployed that can identify a mental illness, a specific that can identify the language of suicide. Um, so in here, they're testing the model, for example, and in classifying individuals as either suicidal, mentally ill, but not suicidal or neither. And they're deploying this AI model that can um, see if it can come to the same conclusions or same accurate conclusion as a human caregiver. Um, so it's being deployed in a lot of other settings. Um, and uh, given this new sort of policy environment, especially in India, um, uh, my personal belief and I think a concern is that this will be kind of the new frontier for global health inequity. Um, if it's not taken and um, taken on in a very responsible way, not to dismiss these models as ineffective, but you can see a lot of these inputs don't go into these um, sort of these material risks that Joy was talking about. These are not inputs that are that the model recognizes. Um, 
So an AI is basically trained on real world data. Um, any bias, any economic, any social biases that were already there in the system, AI models basically amplify it. They, uh, you, so you really see it at scale. They're magnified. It doesn't correct for it. They're just amplified and magnified to a larger population. So in that way, it's a very, um, uh, it raises a lot of strong ethical concerns. Um, and these concerns have already come to face. So in the U.S., there was a, a medical risk scoring algorithm that um, that had a racial bias towards it. So it had uh, assigned lower scores to black patients and white patients, and it reduced the number of black patients that were identified for enhanced care by more than half. Similarly, in the Netherlands, there were these ML models that were looking at child welfare benefits and then wrongly identified low-class immigrants as high risk. So there's all these biases that are integrated into systems because they were already there in health systems and therefore they were getting reflected in models. Um, and then there's a lot of questions that come up where can healthcare workers and caregivers better assess risk as compared to these types of models? Um, and also will differential care when it's practiced, will it actually translate to rationing of care? Um, and by that, I mean, again, India is treating this problem as we have a huge number of patients, we don't have enough people, um, so if we are still keeping the resources finite and the time finite, does that mean we are just going to focus on these high risk groups and then actually end up lowering the standard of care for a lot of the other um, uh, population as well? So that's also something that's a concern um, in terms of deploying, deploying differential care in practice, even though you might not see it on paper in theory. So I'll just stop there for you. Thank you. That's really amazing work, Shrisha. I mean, I I I love your analysis. I, I have to say, as one of your professors, I'm proud of your analysis because, you know, these technologies. You know, I, I, first of all, the work you had done for your thesis and continue to do um, is so important. India is still the highest burden country in the world with TB, the numerical uh, numerical burden. Um, I, I certainly am concerned about what COVID has done in India to TB case finding and outcomes because we know around the world um, it has had a profound impact and India had one of the worst crises uh, with COVID-19. But, you know, to bring up these, the AI, I mean, I think there's so much promise for things like this, but if it's not done in a powerful way, it is, as you say, going to amplify the inequities. Um, and so, you know, very important work. Um, so I guess my question for you is how, how would you seek to, to address that? Like what, what would be ways, because I think, you know, AI is, I think we're, we have a future with AI, like I'm not sure we can back away from it. So how would you, from an equity lens, try to look at AI to make the right kind of policies? Yeah, so I think one of the challenges that, um, if you look at the, uh, like the team, right, um, that makes up these AI solutions, um, they're the ones that are identifying what the core problem is. And a lot of times what happens in these teams, they're, they're engineers, they're not public health professionals. So exactly. there's no lens that actually emerges in terms of um, a public health lens or social responsibility lens, an ethical lens. Um, so you can't treat it as just an engineering problem. Um, yeah. That's one. And then I think second is part of um, my focus now is actually very rigorously evaluating these models so as they get deployed. Um, you're understanding, okay, let me compare that to a human caregiver, like a healthcare worker. And that is my gold standard, right? Because as a caregiver, they're able to assess risk, uh, including all of these material, psychological, emotional, all these different shared care needs. And where is it that the AI is um, failing to do that? So there's very quantifiable metrics around that, right? Just in terms of accuracy of these risk classifications, if you look at caregivers as ground truth. Um, and that feedback, I think, is continuously important to provide back. Um, and like I said, I'm not saying, you know, it's not, uh, uh, it's not sort of, a, I think it has value, uh, definitely, Absolutely. and especially in India, because India is a big data country. It's very, you know, technology forward huge population, there's not enough resources in the near future that's going to be able to cater for care. Uh, but I think it's, it's you know, it requires a huge kind of responsible framework to look at. Yeah, and I, I, um, 
I, I think it's great that they have you doing that. Um, that's that's a great role. Um, I would just you know caution all of us that even when we are looking at the human versus AI, that unfortunately many of the human clinicians that we have on earth at this moment are not really looking at the social medicine yeah. lens. So even that, which I think is a good gold standard to have, it's not the gold standard we all want collectively because we know sometimes the social yeah. and economic realities are really neglected and there is inherent racism and bias in our systems and inherent classism. So um, I'm sure you're thinking about that, but I think the gold human versus AI way is a good way to start. Yeah, I think the human, I mean, the way we've structured is the human caregivers are um, the people trained in sort of these social models. So the way they're good. assessing risk is actually looking at a comprehensive um, social, psychological material out there. So that's, that's great. Very, with intent, infusing that into uh, risk management. Yeah. That's really good. That's wonderful. So Jude, um, I'll uh, go on the, the question in the chat. The first question is for you. Um, looking at the, the risk of developing resistant TB is high in, in Haiti. Um, are there mobile clinics? Are there other outreaches, uh, approaches to, I think, prevent the generation of resistant bacteria? And maybe you can answer that as well as I know you will from like a kind of social lens. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you for that question. And I would say, obviously, the situation is getting worse because, um, as as I mean, if you could um, recall, like from 2015, uh, we we were able to reach about 12 percent of our estimated DR to be burden in 2021 that number shrank to 6%, or actually less than 6%. So, I mean, it's uh, it's no wonder why, because of all the social, political hell that we are going through. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely, there, there are more and more and more patients who are just cut off from mm -hmm. uh, available, in, 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 in quotes, uh, help. Uh, as an example, <clears throat> now with the gang situation, the, the, the South, like a whole segment of the country is just cut off from, from where the, the two, I mean, from, from an area where usually, which is the, 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 the West, I mean, the, the capital, and then ZL in, in a, in a little, little bit, um, um, I would say, I mean, in the central plateau. So, which means there is no way those patients, even though they are suspected, there is no way they are brought to care. So, to be honest with you, we don't have a good, I mean, good data because everything is like crumbling, but it's uh, it's obvious. It's obvious uh, things, things, are, things are getting worse. Uh, with regards to mobile clinic outreach, prior to that, um, we were able to do some, and I still think within our catchment area, we 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 we're trying. I mean, Zio, PIH, we're trying to reach out to some patients, some other NGOs, or TB care providers within their catchment areas, are trying to to do some outreach. But again, because of uh, the political social condition with gang now on top of everything, uh, there has been a lot of, a lot of disruption. And unfortunately, day by day, things are getting worse. Mm -hmm. And I mean, no one, we, we're not gonna lie. I, I don't think, I mean, the situation is, is getting worse. Few things that TB care providers were trying to do just, just got disrupted. Just, just, yeah. just, just, and, 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 and I don't think much we will be able to do, to do much, uh, if, if, uh, the, the country does not address the, the security situation, particularly with gangs, um, spreading, mm -hmm. uh, further yeah. further. yeah, thank you. I mean, I think that, um, what's, what's so complex with TB as, you know, both Trisha and Jude pointed out is really the, 
the the fact that it's a social disease and the fact that the people who really are the most marginal to a health system are the ones most affected. And so it becomes like a chicken and the egg phenomenon because it's not only your risk is elevated if you're poor, then the, the so your risk because housing, food, et cetera. And then the detection is often later or erratic, meaning you have more disease. And then the follow-up is more complicated. So you have more risk of uh, the re resistance. And I think this is probably true in so many diseases. TB is just such an obvious one because it's airborne. But then looking at the impact of other social forces on TB, whether it's COVID or the societal unrest, you know, those things and many others, I'm sure we'll see, you know, in war, we see huge increases in TB. We saw that in Afghanistan. I am sure in Syria and Turkey, after this big earthquake, we will see uh, increases in TB. It, it, it's a thermometer for the kind of sort of injustice that we see. Um, and, you know, and I think this is why in social medicine and in the program on global health and, uh, you know, delivery, we have had, you know, many of our students focus on TB and for many years, our department, indeed, the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine has done a lot of work on TB. Uh, Annabelle uh, Slingerland, who's always with us, thank you so much on these uh, chats. She, um, she is from Netherlands and the AI misclassification, uh, which caused worsening effects in her own country instead of recognizing and installing secondary prevention. Um, so uh, I don't know if we can an, uh, unmute Annabelle to ex explain her question since we have some time. Sure, just a second. Is I'm muted. <laughs> yes, now we can hear you. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, so this, um, I'm very delighted you brought this up uh, across the Atlantic and therewith across the world. Um, this in the Netherlands, it's a very, very painful question. It has been all over the news for a year, uh, yet it still hasn't um, resolved itself. So one is pointing to the other, etc. And the idea is it's not so much an AI, um, AI problem as well as um, the idea why they wanted to use it. So sometimes the questions we ask are more important than the answers we give. So the question was, um, how do we look for people who commit fraud in the social security system? Implied in that is that we don't trust each other. Now, what is the percentage of the people who use the social system, social security, social benefits, um, whereas they have no right to do so? If we then make a big fuss about how can we get those people, then we forget the people who we have to let benefit from it. And so they had an entire system and they thought like, uh, people who were black, people who were um, handicapped, people who were all sorts of issues, right, who had some, which were not even issues, they were just characteristics with, with they were born or life events or whatever. They had been in contact with hospitals too much. And they had those tick boxes and all those tick boxes went into the uh, AI system and then classified them as high risk for misusing instead of these people might need it or mm -hmm. let's see why and how these people uh, because that's where you can use ai perfectly for to find out how are they using it why are they using it this way what is the reason behind it because some people might be misusing it because they don't understand it or because they've underlying issues that they can't deal with. Mm -hmm. And so by doing so, we, we've now created a sort of paying those people back, which is almost, yeah, um, undoable because over, over a couple of decades, it affects your children, 
um, later even your grandchildren, it has caused lots of stress, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but now they, they are going to pay people back. And it's said that the people who are getting money for this still have not received that money or the people who really misuse the system, they now yeah. get the money back and the other people yeah. don't. Great. Thank you. So, so I think, you know, what, thank you so much. Uh, what Annabelle is higher highlighting, of course, is, you know, um, that the biases we put into a system are the biases that the system then amplifies or produces. And I think, Shrisha, you definitely pointed that out, but is there anything you want to add? No, I think that's a very good point. The first, um, you know, identifying the right question, I think is is the critical point there. And it's amazing that all these questions are so, the types of questions that they're trying to answer are so complex, right? If you're trying to say, who do I identify as deserving of care? Mm -hmm. And that is a question that's rich of bias, that's rich of all kinds of, um, you know, inequities that we see. And that's not the question that we want to apply an AI model to. AI models would be, you no, know, they're they're sort of designed to be efficient for very simple, you know, re repetitive tasks that have very simple solutions. Um, but complex care delivery or service delivery is definitely um, a, a difficult framing of a question to, for an AI. So there's two questions um, which are listed as for Shrisha, but I, I actually think they're they're good ones for both of you to answer, and I'll I'll put them together. One is for uh, Nicholas Bleedy from uh, Liberia, and the other is from Edwin Mercado, who is a second year student um, in the program from the Philippines. Um, you know, one is what is the level of community involvement in promoting adherence, compliance to TB treatment? And I would say this would be in India as well as in Haiti um, and as well, Jude has worked in Liberia. So if we can talk about how the community can participate in the ongoing compliance, um, and then I'll go to Edwin's question, but I'll have, uh, why don't we start with Jude and then go to Shrisha? Absolutely, uh, thank you. Uh, I mean, the one way uh, PIZ or in Liberia, we've been able to bring community members in supporting adherence is with uh, our companionate model, which is um, essentially most of the time using people from the communities or even family members in the household to to be this first. I would even say caregiver uh, to be this first support to that patient. And this, I mean, this has been very helpful. And I can tell you, uh, particularly from my from, from my experience with, I mean, prior, prior how I left Haiti, particularly with drug resistant TB, this has been so, so, so helpful because as, as you know, DRTB is uh, so complicated. It's a, it's a very complicated disease to have and also to address. So bringing family member close ones are very, very helpful. Um, besides, besides that, I I think no. Usually around providing um, having people to go to do I mean supporting with with dots and doing counseling. Uh, yeah. Besides that, I'm trying to think about other other ways we've been able to bring. Uh, community members. I mean, ourselves, our team. Um, what, 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 what we do, whether in Haiti and in Liberia, we have a. Sometimes we have a, a multidisciplinary teams like the physician, and a nurse, and 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 we do uh, home visits. Um, sometimes we were the one. We are the one bringing uh, those support, like food, and and I mean. Hygiene kits to all patients. Uh, this this help us to to also have an idea about how they are doing um, after they 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 got um, discharged. We've been able to do that a lot prior all the social unrest in Haiti and particularly in Liberia, in in Maryland, uh, in the Monrovia surrounding. We have a couple of patients so. Monthly, we I mean we have an agenda where the team go out and 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 meet our patient um, where 
where they are. So I think those are two quick examples that, that came to my mind. I'll be happy to jump back uh, if other ideas come, but I will hand it over to you, uh, Shirisha, if you wanna add anything else at that point. Yeah, not too much to add. I mean, in the, in the adherence guidelines in India, every TB patient should have a treatment supporter assigned to them um, as a guideline. So that treatment support is usually either a family member or a community level individual who can be responsible for making sure the patient is able to access their medication, engage with their treatment. And with these digital adherence technologies, what we try to do is actually um, you know, make that information available to the community health worker and or to the family member so they can actually monitor that patient's adherence. And then if they don't see a signal, they can call the patient. Um, if they're managing multiple patients, they're also able to call and say, why didn't you? Uh, I don't see anything here. I don't see any data for today. Are you having any trouble? So that's also a mechanism to actually um, empower the healthcare workers at a community level and the family members as well to kind of collectively participate in the treatment engagement. Great. Thanks. I mean, and I, I just want to add from, again, the equity perspective, of course, community is so important. And there's been a lot of great work around the world with community health workers for TB. However, um, you know, we can't put the labor of the work on unpaid workers. And I think this has been, you know, proven over and over again that the attrition of people are just asked to do this uh, out of the goodness of their heart is quite high because, you know, the, if, if you're poor, you need to work every day. So I think trying to figure out what is the role of community and how we provide compensation for other poor people, you know, to look after their neighbors is something that I know Haiti, Liberia, and India have all sort of struggled with in different forms. So just always important to keep in mind. Edwin's question is about the new MDRTB uh, regimen, BPAL. Um, specifically, he's asking uh, about the registration in India um, and what experiences uh, you know we've we've had in terms of patents um, and the supply chain. And I'll direct that to Shrisha, but you know, Jude, you can also weigh in afterwards on your experience with new drugs in Liberia, uh, which you had a lot. Go ahead, yes. Shrisha. Yeah. Yeah, so BPAL regimen has been rolled out in India. It's one of four regimens actually that are um, that are sort of currently in the Indian TB sector. Um, very late start. Uh, uh, other than that, I'm not. It, it it has not reached the penetration that it should. Uh, I am not sure about sort of the exact where the supply chain issues are. Particularly, I can't speak to that specifically. Um, but definitely rolled in terms of rolling out in the Indian context was very late and it definitely has not penetrated um, both public and definitely not the private sector. Great. And Jude, you want to mention uh, just your work with with MDRTB and new drugs in Liberia and if there were any challenges or in Haiti, I know you used that as well. Um, if there were any uh, issues around registration and supply chain. Absolutely. Uh, I'll thank you for that. I don't think, um, I have to double check, but I don't think Liberia has implemented BPAL um, uh, regimen Not yet. Not BPAL, but bedacoline. Bedacoline, the dilemma, the yeah. yes. And actually, uh, yeah, as Joe uh, mentioned, PIH and us, we were the one helping the, the country transitioning from long term to a shorter term uh, regimen with great, great success. Um, I don't think we ha we had uh, I mean problem with 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 patent because um, our procurement I think came from I don't I don't remember exactly but our main issue was uh, uh, stuck out mm -hmm. uh, because it's uh, I mean so I mean the same thing goes goes um, for Haiti but to be honest with you I did. And it's kind of a difficult way to even explain, but we did see the, we did notice that the procurement um, system was, I mean, we, we faced a lot of interruption mm -hmm. in, our, in our drug procurement for Liberia. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's difficult to explain, uh, to be honest, but our main challenge was, was drug, drug procurement, even though, we 
the the treatment regimen essentially change uh, patients' lives. I mean, great success, few few side effects, few serious side side effects to be reported. I don't think I even have to report a serious side effect. Most of what we reported was were were manageable and with great success. And thinking about reducing uh, a treatment regimen from 20 months to eight to eight to tell to 10 months, very great, great success uh, for our patient. But the the drug procurement uh, was was a challenge. Uh, I think because the way uh, maybe uh, the program relied on the, I mean the um, the international <laughs> pace mm -hmm. for that. It was uh, it it was very uh, very uh, challenging. Thank you, thank you, Jude. And I think you know it it addresses an important aspect, which is when new regimens come along, just like when new technologies come along, the trickle down is unequal. Um, we've tried to push that by getting drugs into Liberia, for example, a very poor country. Uh, India's trying with multiple regimens, but we know that um, that you know that can really still be very challenging. And I think this leads to a question that Comfort put in the chat, which is for Shrisha. Um, is AI used systematically now across India or is it just in some pilot regions? And, and I would add to that, what would be your sort of thoughts about massively scaling up in terms of inequity? Uh, so it's these models have, have just been developed and they're literally being deployed in a pilot mode like yesterday and today basically um which is why we're also want to make sure that there's strong research and evaluation frameworks going alongside of it um so they are trying to there's a lot of pressure for to deploy at scale um mm -hmm. because india is very kind of um like i said very kind of technology focused technology centric uh in, with respect to care delivery as at least in the tb program um so there is a lot of pressure to scale and scale quickly. And there are a few voices that are pushing back, which I think are important voices in terms of um, making sure it's done in a responsible way. Um, and then there's other other use cases for AI as well. So for example, I think a lot of people are already familiar with imaging, AI and imaging and things of that nature that are a little bit more um, easy to kind of uh, wrap around. But um, these types of care delivery models are definitely, the aim is to get it to scale. Um, but, uh, you know, and then there's people who are a little bit pushing back on making yeah. sure it's getting done to get it done responsibly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think the last question uh, is from Atu Perry uh, Fury, who uh, is uh, was just um, again <laughs> selected to be in the next class um, and has been working, I, I know Fury well, uh, has been working with the delivery of NCD care. Um, and he's asking about whether um, TB services are free. Does one have to pay? Um, and do you have community health workers in rural communities? Uh, all of these things obviously would lead to, you know, further resistance. And do we see a more pronounced burden between rural and urban free or uh, paying services? That's for you, Shrisha. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um... So it's interesting. I think the biggest divide over the last sort of, I think, eight or nine years in India was the divide between public sector and private sector in TB care. Um, so public sector services, drugs were free, private sector, you had to pay for them. And uh, because of that payment model in the private sector, um, a lot of TB cases were not getting notified into systems. So India very seriously underestimated the TB burden um, just because they couldn't count all these TB cases in the private sector. Uh, because there's no formal mechanism of um, actually getting these patients into these systems um, from a private sector or private clinician. But once free services and free drugs were introduced into private sector, um, that uh, was transformative. That's where we actually saw a huge increase in the number of cases getting reported because now patients actually became visible. They're accessing services. And, not, and with those free drugs also, now because they're visible to the system, 
that comes with all kinds of um, direct beneficiary transfer, material support, food support, incentives, everything, all the, you know, all the advocacy that comes with the public sector is also now made available to the private sector. But with that said, um, this is, I think, probably the single most, one of the, you know, most transformative initiatives in terms of engaging private sector uh, and making services free in private sector, but it's still about 40 to 45 percent penetration of free services still. Um, so it went to zero to about 40 percent in about a decade. Um, so we still have a long way to go. In the private sector. In the private, yeah, in the private. Interesting. You know, I hope you or somebody will write that up because, uh, you know, there's still this mythology, which we certainly teach against in our program, that if people pay for something, they appreciate it more. And that, you know, we're still yeah. fighting that. Yeah. And I mean, that the great thing about India is so large that yeah. it's like hard to make that argument when you have this massive, uh, you know, change, the sea change. And so I hope you all are taking a look at that in terms of that philosophy of payment. payment, And then I, I want to just press a little bit on Atu Perry's second part of his question. What do you know, Shrisha, about rural versus urban? Because I think India, again, being such a large um, area and having both very rural and extremely urban, densely populated areas. Yeah, I mean, rural, there is... Um... Uh, an ASHA model in most of these rural sites um, where you have mostly female staff, again, heavily underpaid, trying to manage TB among a, a lot of other responsibilities and duties. Um, but a lot of the tasks for TB care is sort of just delegated to an ASHA worker in the rural um, sector. Um, you have all these challenges of infrastructure access, so rural patients have to travel to urban um, for to access any kind of you know secondary and tertiary care. Um, especially if it's you know, for severe conditions, admissions, things of that nature. So um, it is, I mean, India is trying to build infrastructure to decentralize a lot of this. There's something called the Health and Wellness uh, Care Center where they're trying to decentralize a lot of these um, secondary services and possibly, possibly tertiary services also to uh, um, a population that can um, um, that can access within a, you know, within a given radius or within a given population. Um, so traditionally where there were, you know, primary healthcare centers are trying to build infrastructure on that. So you don't need, you don't have this uh, physical access and transport barrier. But that's an infrastructure investment that is sort of proposed. So there is a funding allocated to it. Um, but I think the challenge is still going to be, you know, the, the people problem and paying people to do the work problem for care delivery. Are the ASHAs paid? Yeah, they're paid an honorarium, but they're not, uh, it's hugely, it's very di variable in terms of where you are in India, in terms of how they're paid, how much they're paid. Because um, there's a, in generally just sort of, even when India has a lot of incentive schemes, but the problem is there's a lot of red tape in verifying a lot of this before money is released. Mm -hmm. So that's a huge administrative bottleneck that happens um, behind that. But but ASHA workers, they're also responsible for a whole host of other tasks around reproductive health, maternal health. So it's very difficult to manage. Thanks. And it's it's very female centered. I know. know. Also, yeah, which free, is um, free labor um, from women. Yeah. So it's like a women are the caregivers. So it's like always. You know, they're just going to do this out of the goodness women. of their heart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I want to ask, we're, we're close to time here, um, but wanted to ask both of you if you could summarize, and I'll, I'll turn this to Jude first and, and then to Trisha, just how you see the current status of the world in terms of COVID, in terms of the economic inflation, um, and what's happening. You know, there's lots of great things happening on TV, but how do you see this playing out in the next, let's say, two or three years, short term? So, Jude, I'll start with you. I mean, that's, that's a tough question. <laughs> I, um, I, I think. I think COVID gave us one, I mean, a great opportunity to, to really come together. Uh, but I think we missed that opportunity. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I, I think, I mean, for now, even, even in Imarkali, where we, we did great work while in COVID, but you feel like 
the tide is kind of turning against mm -hmm. against us because there is that much attention paying to that and the opportunity to really build something uh, stronger, better for the most uh, vulnerable, I don't think uh, we, yeah. I don't think we, we we take that 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 opportunity. And but in in, in terms of uh, economics um, for TB, uh, I mean, we'll 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 try we'll we'll try to, to stay um, hopeful. But I, I mean, with, with wars, and I don't think, I mean, I, I don't want to be pessimistic, but I, I might say maybe, yeah. To me, it's a, it's a, it's a tough question. <laughs> I, I don't want to. That's why, that's why I asked it. That's why I asked it. It's a, Trisha, it's a I'll, I'll let Trisha bail you out. Trisha, what do you see happening? I don't know if I can bail anyone out, but uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, you still see COVID as it's not gone because in a sense you see the impact it had on TB care. Um, and you, know, you also meet patients, like part of our differential care model, for example, was to do work with very clinically severe patients who required admission and they just refused to go to the hospital because they had memories of COVID, um, of what it did. Uh, that was when you went to the hospital, you never came back. And that's how they saw a lot of um, admission and tertiary care. Um, so I think it still haunts a lot of, um, you know, TB care in terms of resources being displaced. Um, uh, and we really struggled in terms of, you know, like cyst a lot of patients just became invisible to systems. Um, uh, and therefore, you know, when you become invisible to systems and you actually there's really no way for systems to find you or deliver care to you. Um, so I think it's very haunting in that way. And I think, um, yeah, and I think it's it's overall, I uh, yeah, I'll, I'll echo Jude's sentiment that we don't want to be pessimistic, but I'm on a personal road. I, I resigned from the organization that I was working for um, just because I also didn't, I didn't see this sort of, um, coming together in a very kind of responsible way to handle COVID and TB with a very um, proactive um, approach. And a lot of, I think, I don't know what the ecosystem is transitioning to. And I hope this sort of ecosystem of donors and NGOs, there's some fatigue around there as well um, that I sensed that uh, uh, that is difficult to push some of the agendas. And India has an elimination target of 2025 for TB. Uh, so how are you doing on that? <laughs> <laughs> I think we we've, we've regressed quite a bit. Um, so, but yeah, I'm hoping also with you know with with resignation also with I'm um, hoping to start something new and work with people who are little, how, who have that kind of a vision moving forward. We have your back. We have your back. So I'll I'll kind of end this on a positive note because um, it is true. Like I, I with like Jude, like Trisha, I expected better of the world community. Like during this crisis, um, and what we saw, unfortunately, was more nationalism, more otherism, more fragmentation. But it's actually you guys that give me hope because I see this movement growing. This movement of people at a program level in nursing, medicine, pharmacy, who are really talking about equity in a way that is really novel. Um, you know, when I was studying for my master's degree, we were just talking really about sort of epidemiology without looking at the forces that drive inequity. And so, you know, come join us in the master's program. We've had 10 years and I know that people like Shresha and Jude and many people on the phone are really making a difference. And, and part of what we're trying to do, in fact, is grow a community of like-minded people around the world um, that can really stand together with affected communities, uh, with patients, with communities that are, are struggling, and you know, really fight to use new drugs, new technology, and old, reliable things like community health workers in a way to, to generate equity. So despite the struggles, you know, uh, being with all of you gives, gives me a lot of hope because leadership changes. Um, and I see 
generations coming after me, you guys are at least a generation behind me, um, that really can make a huge difference. And, and so somebody wrote in the chat, am I too old for the masters? Nobody's too old for the masters. We welcome everybody. Some people are too young for the masters. We're not gonna take anyone under 18. Um, we do ask generally that you have a few years of experience in the work, because as you can see from Jude's presentation and Trisha's presentation, often people are doing their work within the context that they're already working. So trying to make their own programs better to understand these social forces, to look for chances to improve equity. So the only thing we really ask for is that people have some experience already so that you can use the tools and the community um, of the master's program to, to really improve care for the poorest in the world. So thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Trisha. I'm a little mad at you because I heard you were in town and you didn't come look me up. Was that not true? <laughs> I, I just came in a few days ago. <laughs> well, well, I'm enjoying it. You're in Rwanda, so okay, it's, it's my fault. It's my you fault. Rwanda, you left You're the my continent. Fault. So. <laughs> <laughs> Teresa looks so shocked. I'm totally kidding. <laughs> Um, you know, know, just always look forward to seeing everyone on Zoom in person, seeing the work that everyone's doing. And thank you so much for joining us. Christina, any last words? That's it. I, yeah, just say I chatted this, but just want to say another thank you so much, Jude and Sarisha, for your um, for your expertise, sharing your your thoughts and your expertise on this, and Joya for your leadership. Thanks to everyone who was able to join us today. We had a great turnout, and really appreciate you spending some time with us. And we will follow up by email if you're interested in learning more about the MMSC GHD program. And uh, we do have upcoming alumni talks. And even after we finish celebrating this 10 year anniversary, we have um, alumni talks throughout the year. So we will, if you get on our email list, we will continue to remind you of those. But um, for now, we wish you all the best. And thanks again for joining us.